everyone, welcome back to the channel that knows nothing. I'm Jim, and let's get to it. So, for those of you that don't know, I actually just finished doing my Bachelor of Writing, which means I know all about writing. Actually, it means I know jack shit about writing, but I'm gonna pretend for this video. But I wanted to talk about more about writing on this channel because it's like a big part of my life. I spent three and a half years doing a degree on it and I'd like to think that I kind of know what is good writing, what is bad writing. But today I wanted to talk about villains and how to write a good villain. When I say a good villain, I mean a really good bad guy. Not a good villain. Not a good villain. Not a villain that turns good. Like a bad villain. Ah, uh, you understand. <laughs> Lately, I have been really disappointed in some villains, um, mainly this one, um, because it just goes against everything that I was taught, everything that I know about villains, really. And what I want to do today is sort of go through what my steps are for creating a villain. Lately, I have been a little bit disappointed in villains. They don't seem as bad as they were when I was a kid. Like, I'm comparing it to, like, you know, these great Disney villains when I think of bad guys because that's what your first connection to a bad guy is, is probably from Disney or probably from some weird TV show that no one else watched. What I'm trying to get at is that I'm really disappointed in villains that are targeted at kids because kids aren't stupid, like, and a lot of media that is targeted towards kids, you might not know this, it's also meant for adults as well because it is the adults that are making it. So the adults have to add in stuff that only the, you know, older generation will get. And the, like, the young kids won't get until they're like a little bit older. That's why there's a lot of like, you know, inappropriate jokes that you don't get in Disney until you are older. But I digress. Today I wanted to teach you how to write a good villain, in my opinion. Um, because it's been done before in plenty of successful ways and ways that, you know, aren't weird. <laughs> because the quality of villain that I grew up with, I was always like so amazed by it. I always really liked the villain side of the story and finding out why the villain became the villain. And now I just am disappointed in what we have, especially in like the younger audience things. Anyway, so let's start with my rules for villains. There are five of them, but I'll start with number one, obviously. <laughs> it sounds bad, but let hear me out. Your villain is damaged goods, is rule number one. So, what I'm getting at with this is that the world has been really cruel to them, and they hate the world, is pretty much the jits of that. Um, when I say they hate the world, the world doesn't need to be a physical world, although they can hate society and all that other stuff, but generally the world takes form as a person. And it's generally this one person that they hate and they fixate on and they spend all their time being like, how can I get revenge on this person? And that's pretty much what they do eventually. Just a little side note here, it's kind of relevant to both heroes and villains. I will be doing a hero version of this. Um, and he said the best writers are the ones that know their characters inside and out, back to front. They just know them completely and fully. Fully. <laughs> but the one thing that he said to me that is always going to stick with me because it is the most messed up thing I've ever heard and it's true. He said a good writer always knows how to hurt their characters. Because if you know your characters well, it means you know how to hurt them as well. Which sounds like the most messed up thing you've ever heard, but it's also super relevant. Because if you know how to hurt them, that is going to make a good story. Especially if you're Diana Gabaldon, because she knows how to hurt her characters very well. The reason why I say this is because you need to be a good writer. It doesn't matter in any form, whether it's writing a book or writing a screenplay that's going to be like a film. You need to know your characters really well. and. To know them well is to know how to hurt them, is pr pretty much what I'm getting at. A lot of you I think I have lost, but some of you have probably stayed. <laughs> Moving on into more of the damaged good stuff rule. Going off what I just said, it's also really important to know your hero and your villain really well, and to know that they are equal when it comes to the writing. Because if they're not equal, then it really shows on screen. 
because if you don't spend an equal amount of time developing them, then they both kind of go underdeveloped. Because you could have a really fantastic hero, but then a really crappy villain, and that's not good. Like, you don't want that. Like, unless you want a really stupid villain, and then you can do that, but then again, like, who really likes stupid villains? But yeah, like I said before, to focus too much on one is to leave the other one undeveloped, and then who are you really hurting? <clears throat> it's yourself. This is kind of coming out of the damaged goods stuff and into the other stuff that I want to talk about. Always remember when you are writing a villain and you want them to become like the sort of like protagonist or good in a way to like learn from their mistakes, you need to show it and you need to be convincing. And this is not something that can happen in the span of days or hours because it just doesn't happen. It's not like believable and I've seen it happen time and time again in movies, specifically kids ones, where like they've learnt their lesson and I really, it's really not, it's really bad. Villains don't change over the night. If you look at like the classic villains or at least what I would say the classic villains are in like sort of young people media, like Darth Vader from Star Wars and Scar from Lion King who are very different from each other, they don't change over the night and Scar probably was never going to change but Darth Vader did change at the end if you watch that. Just remember when you're creating a villain, you are starting off with damaged goods. Like if you're not gonna go into backstory with them, if you're just immediately just writing a villain, just remember you're starting with like really, you know, messed up person and they need to grow into, you know, a person that you can believe will be good. Because if you don't explain why the villain is changing and why they are becoming good, it's really, like you're force feeding your audience to feel a certain way which is what happened in Toy Story 4. You can't just tell us that this person is the villain and then they've changed at the end. It's too much in too short of a time span to believe that that person is now good. Pretty much all you need to do is be really convincing that this villain has changed and like I said in my Toy Story 4 rant you need to show that in the span of time time is what changes everything. Time heals everything. Pretty much show me how the villain is good and how they have changed. Show me. Don't tell me because that's really bad. Rule number two is pay attention to your villain which was kind of what I was saying the last thing a little bit but we'll get into it more here. This may not seem like an important one but it is because if you lose control of your villain they'll run right off the page and god knows what's going to happen. Everyone is lost including you. Any form of like creative media tends to get stuck on the hero and what the hero is going through because that's the protagonist. Of course they're going to care about the hero, not the villain. But without the villain, what is the point of the hero? They both need each other to work, especially if your story is focused on that sort of thing. Like especially if it's like the powers of good and evil, like, or superheroes. Generally they, they need to have a nice dynamic is what I'm trying to say. People will go on and on about the hero's journey and how important it is to stick to it. And it is pretty important, but we'll get into that later because we're talking about heroes and villains' journeys later. But one of the most important things I learned off one of my author friends was the hero can't have a journey without the villain. And I know a lot of you must be saying, oh no, that's not true, they can still have a journey. It's just like, the villain doesn't always have to be a person. The villain can be society or like the world they're stuck in, it doesn't necessarily need to be a villain with a face. Like the villain can be society, the hierarchy, or it could be the hero was their own villain the entire time kind of thing. There's always a villain in the story, no matter what story you're writing. There's always something that's going to stop the hero from getting what they want. Truly though, when you're writing heroes and villains, you have to keep in mind that they are not on the same development line than each other. They are different. They are not the same. Generally, it's the villain will know more than what the hero knows. It's just plain and simple as that. Your hero isn't smart straight away because they got to go through some thinking and development before they get there. I'm not saying that your hero can't be smart in general. I'm just saying when it comes to the villain, they are stupid until it gets to a certain point and then they are smarter than the villain. Otherwise, there is no story and you have ruined writing. What I mean when I say this is that the hero needs to develop to a certain point to get to the villain's level. It's not generally a good thing when the hero wins straight away because 
you want to think that the hero is flawed, same as you, the audience. Because without a flawed hero, they're not relatable. What I mean by this is that the hero will need to develop to get onto the villain's level because you want the villain to be smart and bad and all these sorts of things. So the hero will have to go through tasks to get to him, which makes more story. It's not a good story if your hero wins straight away. I go by the rules of three. Three encounters with the hero and the villain. The first encounter should go really terribly. The hero should only just get away from the villain. Second one. The hero should be a little bit better, but not quite as good as the villain. This one, they are equally matched. And the reason why I would use the rule of threes is because you want your hero to be relatable and flawed. That is what is going to make the connection with the audience, no matter what form you're writing in. Because if the hero is not relatable, then you're going to lose a lot of people and no one's going to stick around just for the villain unless they're weird like me. You need to have people rooting for someone and generally that's the hero. But we'll get into that more when I talk about heroes because I don't want to spend too much time talking about heroes because they're boring. Rule number three, a motive and a plan. Now moving on, for your villain to exist in the world that you are creating, they need to have a motive. This is a driving force inside them that's moving them forward towards their goals and their plans, whatever they may be doesn't really matter what those plans are, whatever your heart desires really, um, it, whether it's them stealing their brother's kingdom or the hero killed the best friend, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. As long as it's outrightly evil and utterly painful to the villain, then it's valid. Always remember, damage goods! <laughs> I'm sorry, it's so bad, but it's true. But deep down you have to know what drives them, what they want, why they want it, and how much they are willing to sacrifice to get all those things. Villains are generally the characters that have been through the worst and seen the worst, so don't test them, like, don't make them hesitate, is what I'm saying. Also, with this information, slowly release that to the audience. Let them get to know the villain without the villain just telling them everything. Like, show them who the villain is, because it has been done in terrible ways with telling, and you don't want to, a character like this one. It's really bad because it will reveal too much about their character and make the ending predictable and you don't want that. You don't want people to see the end coming. There is always something moving the villain forward and there can be delays in that path for the villain, but ultimately the villain should get what they want. Which I know sounds bloody horrible because I've just said what I hate most about every children's movie ever. But hear me out, this should not happen at the end of the movie. This will happen early on or halfway through the movie. The villain winning isn't the end of the story is what I'm basically saying. Because this is the point of the hero and why the hero comes in and saves the day and you know, all the other hero stuff that we'll talk about later. The hero coming in and saving the day is both really important to the villain's character, arc and story and it's the same with the hero. This depends on how long of a story you want to write. Whether you're writing a series or whether you're writing one-off, it's important nonetheless. Because you could have this quite nice back and forth that the villain wins, that the hero wins. Because, you know, if you've seen series like Game of Thrones, you know, that's quite back and forth, although the heroes don't win all the time. In fact, almost never. <laughs> Number four is the villain's journey. Kind of like the hero's journey, but not. The villain's journey and the hero's journey are quite similar. They go through the sort of same things, but where the hero is positive, the villain is not. I'm going to go through each one of these bits of the villain's journey, and I will do the same with the hero's journey when I get around to it. Now, if you want to skip this because you're familiar with the hero's journey, then um, you can do so. So number one in the villain's journey is called the ordinary world. So this is before or when they're about to become damaged goods. That's if you like to do backstories and I would highly recommend that you do that. Whether it's flashback or the villain sort of monologuing his story because villains love monologuing. Also personally I love stories about how the villain became the villain. <laughs> and I personally love these because it will make me care for the villain, which also, if the villain is really bad, will create a really, you know, conflicting thing between should I root for the hero or should I root for the villain? Number two 
in the villain's journey is called to adventure. This is when they're truly becoming twisted beings. They're not quite villains yet, but they are questioning their morals and everything that they believed in. Basically, they are being tested whether they should choose the light or the dark. How I sort of see this is Anakin from Star Wars being like, oh, I'm still a Jedi, but I don't know, I have to say Padme. That's where you are in the story because you're not quite killing younglings yet, but you're, you're almost there. Number three is the refusal of the call. Now, most people won't think this one is important, but it is because it is kind of like the first one, but not. The refusal of the call shows that there is still some good in the villain because we know what is happening. We know Anakin's going to the dark side because he thinks it's the right thing to do, but also like seeing that there might still be good in him is kind of like, Basically, it's the last chance for this villain to do the right thing before they fully step over. Number four is meeting the mentor. Now, with the villains, it's not exactly the same as it is with the hero's journey. With the villains, they don't actually meet someone. Not always. I'm not saying it, it never happens. I'm just saying it's not always them being like, hey, fellow bad guy. Because with the hero's journey, it's quite clear, you know, they actually meet a mentor. Like, you know, Luke meets Yoda and Obi-Wan and gets training. Doesn't really happen so much with villains. Generally, this is like a montage of like the villain finding villainy things and doing like secret villainy things behind other people's backs and like learning about the villain ways. I feel like I'm saying villain way too much now. Basically, it's gaining knowledge to help them on their path. Number five is called crossing the threshold and it's basically going from what is known into the unknown. Basically is going from good to bad. They aren't fully villainy until this point. This is where your character embarks on their final journey and this is kind of the point of no return and what some writers say is that once you've crossed the threshold there's no going back. But the thing is for a villain, I can see why they're saying that, but also there are the exceptions. Which I beg to disagree with because I reckon that, you know, because I reckon that any character that is bad can become good and any good character can become bad. It all depends on the writing and how convincing you can be in convincing the audience without forcing them to feel certain ways. But like I said before, this character has to go through massive changes before they can become good again. Number six, tests allies and enemies. Obviously this part is when the villain is truly tested. And I did look this one up because I was kind of confused in what would happen here. <laughs> and what I came across, I was truly horrified by, which was they fail at most things, which I don't think is correct at all. I think they do have a fairly equal scale of successes and losses. It's just the way it works. It's the same way with the heroes. And why I think I believe this is because they have been so fixated on trying to like get revenge on this person, on their enemy or enemies, whatever you want to do. And this is the part where they'll generally team up with someone if you want them to team up with someone. And this someone generally has the same hate that the villain has for the enemy. Number seven, the approach. So the approach is the biggest challenge that the villain and hero will have in this part of the journey. Basically, it's the big bad boss fight at the end. And I know it seems like we got there quite quickly, but if you'd write this, we will not get there quite quickly. Basically, this is the point they had been waiting for, their enemy versus them. Who will be the best? Number eight. Eight ordeal, death, rebirth. So this is what some people will say is the last part of the villain's journey. And especially if you want to do like a really evil villain, this is probably where their story ends. They die. 
this is the part of the story where the hero succeeds and the villain fails for the last time. I really don't like this sort of like, that was a quote that I used if that wasn't obvious, because it makes for a nice ending and no one likes nice endings. Number nine. <laughs> the Road Back. Now many people will say that this doesn't exist in the villain's journey because it wasn't written down, which actually upsets me a lot because I feel like in everyone there is the potential to be good. And we've seen it done before in the character of like Darth Vader and even the character of Goob in Meet the Robinsons. Like it can be done. But we've also seen it done in a lot of bad ways. You have to be really careful when you're doing the road back because you need to do it the right way. You need your characters, like your good characters, like your heroes and other protagonists if you have them, to believe that this person can be good again because when you force it, it's not good. Basically, the road back for the villain is not an easy path for them. They basically have to reverse everything that they've been through since, you know, step number one of this journey. Not only will they have to say sorry and apologize to the protagonists of the story, they will have to do a lot of fence mending there. They will also have to look inwardly at themselves and what they did and why they did what they did. Um, and I don't know what your characters have done, but I'm assuming it's a really bad thing. They gotta do some backtracking and some self-thinking right there. They will have to reverse everything that they have done from step one. Um, but eventually they will have to look at themselves and think about what they did and why they did it and sort of have to forgive themselves in a way too. Um, so this step is really hard and it can be really messy. So if you just want to kill your character in step eight, I will not judge you. There are more steps in the hero's journey, but they don't really apply to the villain. So that's why I haven't used them. So if you're like, where's all these other stuff? It doesn't really apply. <laughs> I'm sorry. But I will get into them more when we talk about heroes. Basically, these are just guidelines. There are no way rules or things that you have to absolutely abide by like if you miss a step or mess up a step no one's gonna know except you because you're the writer but that's why editing means everything rule number five your villain should be as interesting as your hero now this one should go without saying lately i have seen villains being tossed aside and their arcs completely destroyed and ruined with terrible story writing and there's no one else really to blame but the writers and it's really not hard to write a good villain. For me, bad guys were always so much more fun to write than the good ones because bad guys can get away with anything and they have no moral compass. Bad guys basically get to have all the fun without any of the consequences. The consequences are left for the heroes. So what I'm saying here is make your villains weird, make them complex, make them terrible, make them terrifying. Make them stupid if you want. Make them anything that you want them to be. Because they can be anything that you want to be. The only thing that is stopping you is your own imagination and also some rules. But they're important ones. But please, for the love of God, after watching this, do not create a character like Gabby Gabby. That's why I'm making this. Please make a good villain that I can actually love and hate at the same time. And if you do create a villain like her, then I have failed in teaching you all the villainy things. Please write Joffreys because that guy actually does villainy well. Because you hate him. Everyone who's seen Game of Thrones hates that guy. And there's a good reason why. He's an excellent villain. Anyway guys, that's all I've got for you today. Please like, subscribe because that is always nice. You've been you and I've been terrible. Goodbye. <laughs>